honor them and remember their sacrifice. And this weekend, the flags are also at half staff in remembrance of those we've lost to the coronavirus pandemic. We like to pray quickly for those this morning. Would you join us? God, the world feels heavy these days and hard. And some days it's hard to see your goodness around us. There's so many of us grieving and mourning the loss of people we love dearly. Would you be our peace and our comfort and our strength in the midst of trials all around us? And if we're not currently mourning or grieving, God, would you help us to mourn with those who mourn, to step into their grief with them, not try and rush them through it or move them forward. Would we be brave enough to step into the pain with those we love? And God, would you bring peace and comfort to us like only you can do? It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for praying with us. Well, at Gateway, wherever you are, we want to have a place for you to get connected to community. Whether you're brand new here exploring faith or seasoned in your journey of following Jesus, there's a place for you here. And if you're brand new, Maybe today is your first day. A great place to go is to gatewaychurch.com and click on Get Connected. You can tell us where you're watching from, and we'd love to help you connect to a local campus near you. And if you're local to Austin or the surrounding areas, we'd also love to send you a copy of Imagine Heaven by our senior pastor, John Burke. Now, if you've been around here for a while and are really wanting to find community here at Gateway, there are groups all over the spectrum. Great places for you to plug in and journey through this with others. Maybe you're brand new to this whole church thing. Maybe you're not sure what you believe about God. Not sure if he's really who he says he is. If you have questions, Alpha is a great place to explore those. You can go to gatewaychurch.com alpha to find out more, and it kicks off next week. So it's a great time to jump in. Now, maybe this pandemic has made you feel a little bit lonely. Maybe you are sheltering in place alone, or maybe you're sheltering in place with others, and you really need some new people in your life. Community groups are a great place for you to form friendships here at Gateway, and you can find out more about those at gatewaychurch.com groups. Or maybe you are really wanting to grow in your faith. You're really wanting to pursue spiritual maturity actively. Life groups are a great option for that. And you can find out about those and see the open groups at gatewaychurch.com slash groups. Wherever you are on the spectrum, wherever you are in your journey of faith, we have a group for you. Now, some of you have been asking, I want to give help. I want to be a part of bringing life and freedom to those around me. And in part, that's why we receive our offering each week. It's a great way for you to part participate in what God is doing here at Gateway, throughout the city of Austin, and even around the world through our global partners. And you can give by going to gatewaychurch.com slash give help. Now, if you're new here, please do not feel any pressure to give. But if you do feel led to do so, you can also go to gatewaychurch.com slash and click on rather give help. And we want to thank you because so many of you guys have been incredibly generous through this season. You have given financially, you have given your time through serving, you've given donations to our food bank where we've been able to serve more than 100 people each week because of your donations. And some of you this week even gave your very own blood for, through our blood drive. So thank you for being above and beyond generous this, in this season. We are so grateful for you. Now, next week, we're going to be kicking off the, question, the series based on the question we all have right now. What now? In light of our current circumstances, where we are right now, what do we do? Check out this video to learn a little bit more. Yo, why, why another campus pastor? Lame. Where's Burke, the big dog? Dr. Eric Bryant. That's right, the T, thank you. Hmm. No, tell me, doctor, um, how much time have you given over the course of the past few weeks to testing people for COVID? You know, I am not one of those doctors, which I would call heroic, along with our nurses, all those working on the front lines. I have a doctorate in ministry. It's shortened into D-min, doctorate of ministry. This guy's a demon. Just call me Eric. That's okay. Maybe sheltering in place was the best thing for you. Staying at home. It's good stuff. It was good for all of us. Some more than others. So, 
since things are opening back up now, what about you, Dr. Eric Bryant? What now? Well, for many of us, it will continue in this a very odd new normal. Some of us will continue to stay connected online. And a couple of our campuses are even starting to meet uh, in the near future as we figure out the best time to do that. Uh, but I'm excited. Carlos and I are doing a, a two week series called What Now? Where we're Hello? looking at this idea of how can we live in this John, new normal? No, 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 it, no, I'm not busy actually, at all. Jeremiah went through so much and helped we got his Bert. people. Here you go. Oh, absolutely, Johnny. Tell me you're ready. Well, as you saw Eric trying to say in that video, next week we'll be teaching, and over the next two weeks, actually, we'll be teaching from the book of Jeremiah, talking about what do we do now in light of our current circumstances. And we'll also be addressing some of the questions you guys have about our reopening plan and what life will look like at our campuses in the weeks to come. So make sure to join us the next two weeks for What Now? Now today, we're going to be continuing in our What's After Life series, and you'll get to hear from our senior pastor, John Burke. Thanks, Katie. Well, today we are wrapping up this What's After Life series, and I want to do so in a special way. I want to take you on a tour of the city of God. I want you to imagine that day when you take that tiny step from this life into the next life. Not the end, but the beginning of the life you've always longed for. And that perspective, I hope, changes the way you live now. Because as we've been seeing, this life actually is continuous with the next life. You know, we've been saying that heaven is a gift. Relationship with God, it, you don't have to earn it. Anyone who wants it can have it. He wants you if you want him. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved or set right with God. So heaven is a gift, but how we live this life really does affect the experience of the life to come. And that's why today I want to inspire you to live all out, fully surrendered to doing the will of God so that you live your best life now and forever. You know, John, Jesus' youngest disciple, um, writes in the book of Revelation about an experience he had, much like NDEs, near-death experiencers have. He had it in his old age. The risen Jesus appeared to him at, while he was exiled for his faith on the island of Patmos, and he's taken up into heaven, and he's shown the city of God, the new Jerusalem. Listen to how he describes it. In Revelation 21. He says, and he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like jasper, but clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. And on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. The angel measured the city with a rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia, which is about 1,400 miles in length and as wide and as high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement and it was 144 cubits or 216 feet thick. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, but as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. And the great street of the city was gold, but as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, Jesus, are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God is its light and the lamb is its lamp and the nations will walk by this light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it nor anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful but only those whose names are written in the lamb's book of life. Now I'll be honest, I used to read this uh, and I would have this picture of like, a horrible 80s televangelist set, you know, like just cheesy gates with pearls and, you know, gaudy yellow brick road gold uh, on streets, and it just did not appeal at all. 
And then I started to study what more and more indie ears described. The very same place. But this is a world of mystical wonder. You know, they're describing something that is more real, more solid, but just like everything on earth is made of the earth, of, of dirt and, and wood and stone and elements of the earth, everything in heaven is made of the light and love and life of God. Which trying to describe that is like trying to describe uh, three dimensions of color in two dimensional black and white terms. It's just nearly impossible. And yet, as you listen to people who have died clinically and been resuscitated and experienced this city to come, it's a real city with real people and real beauty, but it's a place of mystical wonder. It's a place where those who love God get to live together forever. It's the place we will finally feel at home. Captain Dale Black was a commercial airline pilot, had a plane crash in Los Angeles. Everyone died. He came back to describe flying in to this city, the New Jerusalem, with two angels flanking him. Now listen to how this PhD, this aeronautical engineer, describes this very real place. And I want you to imagine the day that you come in to this beautiful place, this place you'll call home watch. In your book, you describe flying into, is it the New Jerusalem? What is it? Uh, And uh, and describe the beauty and what you saw. I get this incredible uh, airborne view, a descending, slowing down airborne view of the city of gold. And it's city. It's a city that's walled. Over the city were majestic mountains that were as gorgeous as any that could be ever seen. However, they did not look that different than Earth. I wasn't disappointed by that. I'm not saying that. I noticed snow. So think about that. Snow. What does that mean? Atmosphere? Temperature? Snow? What's that all about? I noticed flying birds later. What does that mean? Uh, These are the kind of questions I ask. Okay, if a bird is to fly, it can't be a vacuum. I'm hearing music. What does that mean? Music can't transfer in a vacuum. It has to be in an atmosphere. There's atmosphere here in heaven. Oh, what does that mean? And you're flying, but you don't have wings. Right. I'm floating is what I would call it. I'm floating and coming in, descending. And finally, I come down and touch ground level for a while. And I'm hovering between 40 feet ish and down. And uh, but I, I recognize later, oh, there was gravity there. There is gravity. There is atmosphere. There's water. There are animals. Oh, yeah. Oh, see, it all makes sense now. And this is a real place. I mean, Jesus talked about it his, his last night on earth. He said, I'm, I'm going to this place and you're going to follow me there. John experienced this same place and Christian indie ears talk about it as well. And it's fascinating as I've interviewed so many of them that they all have slightly different perspectives. It's kind of like interviewing people around a street that saw an accident. They all see a little bit different perspective. They have a little bit different memories, but when you hear it all, it puts it together in this cohesive picture. And Dale here is describing paradise. Now I'm not 100% sure this is correct, But some indie ears talked about paradise as the outskirts, the countryside around the city of God, the new Jerusalem. It's fascinating because Jesus said to the thief on the cross who professed faith in Jesus that last moment, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. And it's this gorgeous countryside like earth where many apparently start uh, and it, it kind of acclimates them to heaven, and they start on this journey toward the center, toward the place where God is. Because apparently not everybody is ready to go straight into the city and right up to the center. You know, Howard Storm, uh, the atheist college professor that uh, we heard from last week, who Jesus rescued out of this hellish experience when he cried out to him, He said they were headed toward this city, this incredibly brilliant 
light when he just felt like he couldn't go any further and they stopped. And right there, uh, Jesus gives him a life review and he, he learns a whole lot. He says, but I could still see far off this city and in the center, this brilliant light and this multitude singing. Dale said the same thing. There was a multitude in the center of the city singing praises to God. But Howard asked Jesus a question. He said, so what happens to people when they're going toward the center, but they aren't ready? And Jesus said, they freeze up. And Howard said, what do you mean they freeze up? And he said, they just lock up and they think about themselves and they work on their stuff. They want to move forward, but they're not ready to. Which I'm not totally sure how that all fits with what the scripture says, but I would say this, that's why to work on your stuff now. (laughs) Work on it now. And, And the point, the goal is intimacy with God. The goal is full surrender, full harmony with the will of God. Because not everyone enters heaven in the same place of understanding of knowledge of God or the will of God. You know, and apparently just like their prime properties here on earth, right? And those who have the most money or the most power, no matter how they get it, you know, they can get the prime properties. Well, in heaven, there are prime properties too. The closer to the center of the city, apparently the more spectacular the experience of the life of God you get. And the currency of heaven is the currency of faith and of love, of faithfulness to God. So not everyone immediately goes right into the city of God or right up to the center. Some apparently are not ready for it. Maybe they live on the outskirts, still enjoying all the amazing sights and sounds and and wonders of the beauty of God's creation and relationship. But those who have lived more fully surrendered have a more full experience of heaven. You know, Jonathan Edwards, uh, a well-known theologian, said something very much like this. He said, in heaven, we will all be overflowing with the glory of God, the life and love and joy of God. But we won't all be overflowing with the same capacity. Some will have a small capacity overflowing. Some will have a large capacity overflowing. And you know, that's, that's why you know, to work on full surrender to God now. Because I believe that's what all the talk of, in the Bible of the rewards of heaven is all about. Now, I know this bothers some Christians, but Jesus is absolutely clear that how we live this life really does affect our experience of the life to come. That this life is really just a test It's just a test to see how faithful will you and I be with what God has entrusted to us now. All our money, it's just monopoly money. All our properties, they're just little plastic pieces. And they all go back in the box when the game of life is over. And the only thing that goes with us is how you played the game. How you honored God. How trustworthy you were and I was to God. That's what matters most. And Jesus was very clear on this. Luke 16, 9. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends, Jesus said. Then when your earthly possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. And then he says, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven, the things that last? See, Jesus says this life is just a test of our faithfulness, our trustworthiness to God. Now, I believe there is actually growth in heaven that we continue to grow and learn and explore. Otherwise, we would be God, right? We continue to grow in knowledge and understanding of God. But how we start and what we begin to experience is determined by how we live in this life. Again, this life is continuous with the next. You know, even the things that it said in the Bible, like when we honor God, when we tithe our resources to help build God's kingdom. Think about it like this. It's like investing in heaven's stock market and it never goes down. 
or when we use, uh, when, we, when we study the Bible to learn about the knowledge of God and the will of God, and we seek to be faithful to who God is and what he wants in little ways or in big ones. It, it's like we are coming into harmony with the God of the universe. We're moving toward the center. We'll be able to experience more of the glory of God right away. So imagine one day you're coming up to this city. You're gonna see your new home. Jesus talked about this too. He said, in my father's house are many dwelling places. I go to prepare a place for you. It's interesting in this, are two Greek words. Uh, My father's house is the word oikos. It it literally means a a, a larger dwelling place for the extended family and, and relatives. And then our many dwellings, mone, which can mean house or mansion or any size dwelling. In other words, it's all home to you. All of God's city is home to you, but you will also have your own special dwelling place created for you uniquely by the one who knows you best. Can you imagine? Can you imagine seeing the home that, was designed by the creator of the universe who knows you better than even you know yourself. Imagine that as you listen to this. I could see, uh, we'll start from foreground to back, if you like. Uh, I could see the townships, as I call them, homes that people lived in, homes that were likely to be created for the people of heaven. Interestingly enough, they struck me by not so much the size as the architecture. I know nothing about architecture Hmm. at all. I still don't. But uh, I recognize that there was something divine about the architecture of the buildings. There were small, what we would call like uh, condos here. There were single family residences that we would call here. There were huge palaces. And I could see that, but... And this is all inside the wall? On the other side of the wall, I saw none of this. And how big is this city? I mean, can you tell? I could not tell other than it was beyond the horizon both directions. There's countryside inside, so that it's a, it's gorgeous, beautiful, all of the adjectives times a thousand. So just imagine your excitement about you're gonna enter in and get to explore uh, this incredible city, and it's huge. I mean, John in Revelation 21 said the angel measured it in human measurement, 1,400 square miles and as tall. It's a mysterious city. It's, it's clear as crystal. Some in the ears described it as like this clear, transparent crystal palace, but it's gold too, which doesn't make sense, but it's also made of love woven together. Mystery beyond our dimensionalities. But it's also half the size of the United States, the footprint, and that tall uh, in three dimensions. So it's big enough for all uh, humanity, really. And your welcoming committee, they're they're so excited to show you around. They wanna show you the home they've been working on for you under the, the master designer who knows you best. So imagine you start to go up toward the wall to enter the gate. Betty Maltz, uh, a Christian who died and was resuscitated, describes what it felt like coming up to the entrance. She said, my emotion was a combination of feelings. Youth, serenity, fulfillment, health, awareness, tranquility. I had arrived at where I had always dreamed of being. The wall to my right was higher now. It was made of multicolored, multi-tiered stones. A light from the other side of the wall shone through a long row of amber-colored gems several feet above my head. Topaz, I thought to myself. I not only heard singing, I felt the singing, and I joined the singing. And suddenly I realized I was singing the way I had always wanted to, in high, clear, sweet tones. The voices burst forth in more than four parts, but also in different languages. I was awed by this because I could understand them all. The angel stepped forward and put his palm, the palm of his hand, upon a gate which I had not noticed before. 
About 12 feet high, the gate was a solid sheet of pearl with no handles and some lovely scroll work at the top of its Gothic structure. The pearl was translucent so that the atmosphere inside the city was somehow filtered through. My feeling was of ecstatic joy and anticipation at the thought of going inside. Do you remember what it was like as a little kid on Christmas morning? How you just, you're about to burst with excitement. It's going to be better than that. And there's only one requirement to enter into this city. Listen to what Dale and and Don, uh, a pastor who was actually run over by an 18-wheeler and found himself right before this gate, Listen as they come up to this gate, which by the way, remember the angel said, uh, it's, it's an arch through the wall and the angel measured the wall as 216 feet thick. So it's actually a tunnel through the wall. But listen to how they describe exactly what John said in Revelation. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Nothing evil will ever enter, only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Watch. And at this magnificent gate, a very large uh, uh, wall, a very thick wall, and uh, but there's a gate, and it looks like the inside of an oyster. It's it's a gate made of pearl, uh, really quite dazzling, very brilliant, very beautiful. It almost looks like it's pulsating with life, except I I know it's the light reflecting off the gate that makes makes it look that way. The arch and the tunnel was the same substance. It was not stone, but it was in the stone. But what was the substance? It, the substance was pearl. It, it looked like liquefied pearl. And when the light from the thro- throne room, that's the only light that there is, emanated through, it just bounces off the pearl. There's no shadows and there's no darkness at all, and there's no need for uh, unnatural or artificial light. Mm. It is, uh, it is uh, a sight to behold and welcomed me to go through it, but I, I couldn't go through it at that time. Well, later I found, after I looked at this angel and looked over, uh, I began to communicate from my heart to his heart. You know, would I be able to go through? Is, is that what you're wanting me to do? Because I really wasn't directing the shots, Mm -hmm. and I was in no position to say I want to do anything. The large angel, the largest one, which was standing to the side in front of the gate, uh, began to move in front of the gate and just lovingly, I mean incredibly lovingly, uh, let me know that sure I can come in if your name is written in the book. And the book opens, and it opens just to the right page, to the correct page. And in that page is my name. I began to understand that every human creation is written in this book. And unless their name is blotted out, I said, I don't know anything, I, I don't know about this right now, but the name of my name was not blotted out. And that was seemingly important. I'm going, this is just an understanding that came to you? Everything comes into the heart. But you understood. I understood. That your name was in there. It was not blotted out. So you think that was the book of life? I I believe it is now that I've come back and, and, and read about it. I believe that's exactly what it was. And the first date was March 21st, 1949. I didn't recognize that date. And then there was June 27th. 1961, and uh, that'll date me, but I don't care. You know, that dates me, but these are two dates that I couldn't, for the life of me, figure out their significance, and they're connected to my name. What's that all about? And everybody that's there, my two angels, the two other angels that are there, my welcoming committee's over there, everybody's just joyous. They're full, so full of love and joy. And I'm not worried, but I'm wondering what all this is and what are these numbers and what do they mean? And then I begin to understand, oh, this is the day of my creation. This is when God created me. Not, your, not your birthday before that. Yeah, not my birthday. But and the second was, date? And the second date 
was the day I received Jesus into my heart and life. And Jesus promised all this. In Revelation chapter three, Jesus says, I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce before my father and his angels that they are mine. They are mine. See, that's the most important question. Are you his? Do you belong to him? And like we've been saying this whole series, if you want him, he wants you. All you have to do is tell him. And what Jesus did was died on the cross to pay for your sins, to make you worthy to enter in because he pays for all our wrongs. Do you belong to him? If you don't know that for sure, give him your heart today. So imagine you're coming up to enter in and they all say the same thing. Here's what Don Piper said as he was about to enter in. I continued to step closer to the gate, assuming I would go inside. My friends and relatives were all in front of me, calling, urging, inviting me to follow through this iridescent gate. As we came closer, the music increased and became more vivid. The closer we got, the more intense, alive, vivid everything became. Just as I reached the gate, my senses were even more heightened. I felt deliriously happy. Imagine that day, like Christmas morning, but so much better. And you go through the gate and you enter into this city bursting with life. You you see gardens and parks and streets and trees and amphitheaters, but all of this otherworldly substance, not unlike earth, but uh, new as well. You're trying to take it all in and your relatives or your friends are showing you around and then they bring you to your house. They've actually been helping construct it under the design of the great designer, God himself. And he has constructed something uniquely for you. Perfectly suited for your taste. I mean, imagine that. And, and you notice as well that there are different homes from different periods of human history, all beautifully designed, perfectly suited for each inhabitant. And, you know, one of the most fascinating near-death experiences I studied actually came from the 1890s, way before medical resuscitation. And Rebecca Springer talks about uh, her brother-in-law showing her her home that he had been a part of helping build for her and her husband who hadn't come yet because he hadn't died yet, but many of her relatives had. And she described her home as this beautiful two-story with verandas, two-story verandas wrapping around and marble columns and exquisite sitting rooms, things that you would love in the 1800s, maybe not now. And then she talked about how uh, her relatives had homes nearby and how they would visit in each other's homes and they would go and enjoy a day at the lake, at the lake nearby. Yes, there are lakes, but get this, full of the water, the living water of God. In these lakes, you don't have to hold your breath. You can breathe underwater and when you come out, you're dry and, and you have this cleansing experience, this exhilarating experience that many indie ears say is, is like a healing and by the way, all this is in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, and you can explore more of it in Imagine Heaven. It's wondrous, mysterious, but it's real. More real, they say, than this life. And then imagine Jesus comes, and, and he explains to you the work that you'll be doing. Work? I thought this was retirement. No, there's work, but it's work when work is your passion. You know, you, have, you, have you ever had that kind of feeling when, you know, you're just in the zone? That's what it's gonna be like. You know, in fact, Colton Burpo, a four-year-old kid who had a near-death experience, once his father, who's a pastor, finally believed this was real, he asked him, he said, what was your favorite part of heaven? And Colton shocked him, he said, my homework. He said, homework? He said, yeah, Jesus would come and give me assignments to do, that was my favorite part. See, work in heaven, is glorious. It, it, it's, it's like when you've gotten lost in a project, when you're just in the zone. You know, I, I watch my son right now as, as he has uh, created a, a business around his passions, music and, and vocal coaching, and he just gets lost in it. Just time is ir irrelevant, right? 
You know, when I wrote Imagine Heaven, it was like that. I got lost in the wonders of putting all this together. It wasn't like work. It was, it was like time came to a standstill. That's the work of heaven. But by the way, you can start to experience it now. As you follow God, as you develop the gifts and passions he's given you, as you don't give in to fear, but you boldly follow him into what he's created you for. But there is work and responsibility in heaven. It's what we were created to do. You know, in Genesis 1, before the fall, before sin, before the frustration and and decay and, and disease and computer viruses happened, work was blissful. It's what we were created to do, to co-create, to oversee with God. Listen to how Dr. Mary Neal describes the people inside the city busy about God's work. So coming up to this dome structure, maybe, was it a city? Could you tell? Was there something inside? Was there an entrance into it? There was an entrance. It was a big arched entrance and a wide threshold. What did that look like, that entrance? Well, similarly, it was almost like the old Roman block arches. But again, these blocks were uh, seemingly solid looking, but not. They were really woven together with love, which is nonsensical. Uh, but but you were aware of a structure? Yes, an arch. it seemed structural to me. And was there, and you know, the gate of heaven or a It gate? wasn't, well, I don't, there wasn't a gate. When it was gate. just an archway. Yeah. And I would say again that if I had any inclination that I was coming back, I would have tried to make more mental notes because many of the questions are the same questions that I ask myself now. And I will say that I was able to see many, again, people, angels, spirits, I'm not sure, very busy. And I don't know what they were doing. Inside the Inside, they were all very busy. (laughs) I don't know what they were doing, but they were doing something and clearly doing God's work. Clearly doing God's work. I mean, imagine, you know, if you, if you love to create, imagine uh, being asked to, to create for the president of the universe to display your work. Imagine having all the time in the world for that music or that art that you never had time for on earth. Imagine all the time in the world to research, explore, discover, develop, build for the great builder, the great designer, the greatest scientist of the universe. Now, Dr. George Ritchie is an MD and psychiatrist who had an NDE. And he said Jesus led him into this dazzling building with high ceiling corridors and people walking about buzzing with excitement. He said everyone, it looked like, was enthralled in discovery on the verge of some great new breakthrough. Richie said, we entered a studio where music of a complexity I could not begin to follow was being composed. Next, we walked through a library the size of the whole University of Richmond. Here, I thought, are assembled the important books of the universe. Immediately, I knew this was impossible. How could books be written somewhere beyond earth? But the thought persisted. The key works of the universe. See, part of the reward of heaven are the types of of projects or roles or responsibilities or or creative endeavors, you know, exploration, assignments that we get to do because we were faithful to God on earth. You know, Jesus said, Matthew 19, I assure you that when the world is made new and the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have been my followers will, will sit on 12 thrones. He's speaking to his 12 disciples, judging or ruling the 12 tribes of Israel. See, ultimately, God is going to make everything new. Right now, heaven and earth are separated for a time. And we're experiencing heaven separate from earth. But one day, God is going to make everything new and rejoin all of it. And Jesus says, what we do in this life goes on into the next. And God rewards those who are faithful. In fact, Jesus gives a parable. He likens God to a wealthy man who's about to be made king, who entrusts his money to 10 servants and says, use it for my business purposes till I come back as king. And he returns as king. Luke 19, the first servant responded, Master, I've invested your money and made 10 times the original amount. Well done, 
the king said. You're a good servant. You've been faithful with the little I entrusted you. Now you be governor over 10 cities as your reward. The next servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made five times the original amount. Well done, said the king. You will be governor over five cities. And he's saying God rewards our faithfulness. You know, we, how faithful we've been to him determines how great the assignments. Because see, here's the deal. God is equipping us. He's equipping us to co-rule with him for eternity. Even going through the sufferings and the hardships when you're faithful to God, it has a purpose. It says in 2 Timothy 2, if we endure hardship, we will reign with him. You know, it's amazing But Jesus said it, some will govern or rule over angels, some over cities, some over nations, some over angels, some over animals, some over various projects. It's going to be work, but life-giving work. But it's not all work and no play. God is the originator of fun. (laughs) Everything fun that we've ever invented here on earth is because God created us for play and exploration as well. If there's anything you love about, you know, culture and exploration and fun, anything you've loved about this life, it's just a tiny taste of what God has in store for you. Listen as Don Piper describes this place that you're about to live in. Well, the gate is quite large. Um, uh, The the, the gate itself, the entrance is small, um, and the wall is very thick, but you can actually see through it. So I'm looking over these people, and I can see through it, and there there appears to be this massive boulevard that really kind of bisects the city, and it is made of gold. But gold that is so pure, you can see through it. It's, it's, what do you mean? Well, you can actually see through the gold. It's gold and it's visible and tangible, but it is, it is pure. Now we can't imagine that here because gold on earth is one of the densest metals we have. But in heaven, it's so pure, you can see through it. So you can see under it. You can see even the roots of trees and things like that. There are trees there. In fact, the tree of life is there Mm -hmm. uh, that we were not able to eat of here. We can eat of it there. And you can, you're looking through. I'm looking at the tree. I'm looking at the gates. I'm looking through the gates. I'm looking down the street. There is a river that flows from this this throne or this hill that's high and lifted up. And I know that's the river of life because we're told that it flows from the throne of God. So uh, many of the things that we know and enjoy and love here uh, are visible there as well. Um, I would say this, and and, um, heaven's never going to be less than this. It's always going to be more. Yeah. So whatever you imagine here that is, is meaningful to you, do, to you, the relationships, the beauty, and let's face it, there's some glorious places yeah. on earth, but there should be because God created it. This is His place. So heaven's not going to be less than that. It's going to be more than that. There are structures on both sides of the, of the city. Uh, they look like uh, mansions to me. I mean, they're glorious places for people to dwell. Um, so it, it's just a, it's just a, an incredibly awesome, overwhelming, bustling place. It's not a boring place. There aren't any cherubs sitting around on clouds playing harps. This is an active, exciting, thrilling place. Thrilling, a thrilling place. But the highlight of it all, at the very center of it all, is the God of light and love. And if you didn't catch this from the many indie ears who continually said, but all the beauty and and the wonderful people and all these new sights and sounds and colors and this new experience of senses and even flying, none of it compared to being in the presence of this God of light and love. Because what you'll realize is in God's presence, you realize who you really are how special you are to him, that you are one of a kind, his unique son or daughter created for him. And in his presence, you want nothing else. You never want to leave. And that's true today as well as it will be then. So keep moving toward the center, 
toward God, toward intimacy with God, toward harmony with knowing God and knowing God's will because one day soon, you will find your name in the book of life and you will go through that gate and you will hear the king say, well done, good and faithful servant. Now enter in to my joy. Well, before I pray and we close in a song, I don't want you to let this series just inspire you without changing you. What are you gonna do? What's your next step to grow closer to God and who he created you to be? You know, maybe you've never opened your heart to God. Do it today. You know, your relationship with God starts with a simple prayer of the heart. God, I want what Jesus did to count for me. I want your forgiveness. I want your guidance, your leadership. And just pray with me today and know that heaven is a gift that you've accepted. Eternity with God, relationship with God can never be taken away. And if you pray that with me today, I want to encourage you to go on our website and and click on the Get Connected button and tell us that you prayed to to open your heart to Christ because I want to send you a free copy in the mail of Imagine Heaven, okay, so that you can go deeper in this relationship with God. And even, you know, if you know God, don't just wander back to the old ways. Get serious about spiritual growth. If you're not connected in an online group, go on our gatewaychurch.com and just click join an online group. It's a great time to try it out. You know, 10 or so people, no perfect people allowed, no prerequisites. You'll get to know some friends and you'll start to grow together. And maybe, maybe you say, well, I still have questions about whether I even believe any of this. Great, an alpha group is the thing for you and it's starting next week. It's led by someone who three years ago was a skeptic and not a believer. So doubters are welcome. So go on our website, join an alpha group. If you do still have questions tonight at 7.30, I'm gonna be hosting a a Facebook Live event on our Gateway Austin uh, Facebook page, or you can just go to our website and click on the live stream or there'll be directions there. And I'll be on video chat and you can type in your questions and uh, I'll, I'll spend about an hour answering whatever questions you have left. So join us tonight at 7.30. Don't miss the next two weeks uh, as Carlos and Eric talk about what now. And before we go, if you need prayer today, we have a prayer hotline. Um, You can call this number if you're hurting, you just need someone to pray with, or you know, you just need prayer for something. You can also click on live prayer right down there below. Well, let's pray and then let's close with a song about that day that we're welcomed into the Father's house. God, some of us right now, we want to open our hearts to you for the first time. And if that's you, just tell him, God, I want what Jesus did to count for me. When he died on that cross to forgive my sins, I need that. And thank you that you do forgive me. That's your promise. And come and lead and guide my life. And God, thank you that that is all we need to be made right with you forever. But God, we want to be people who live this life to get more in line with the center of the universe, to move toward knowing you better as we read your word, to move toward doing your will more day by day, realizing that that is the path to our best life now and forever. And so God, that's what I pray will be the result of this, that all of us will move year by year, day by day, closer to you closer to your will. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Sometimes on this journey I get lost in my mistakes What looks to me like weakness the campus for your strength My story isn't over My story's just begun Cause failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does Yeah, failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does
father's in the room 